Hi there, and welcome to All Knit If I Want To. I'm Andrea Maury of Drea Renee Knits, and this is a little weekly podcast where I try my best to answer some of your questions. Today I am wearing my tessellated vest because Rhinebeck is just around the corner. I can't even believe how fast this year is going. A little too fast, if I'm being honest. Um, but I'm so excited for New York Sheep and Wool Festival. I hope to see you there, maybe wearing some tessellated, either the vest or the sweater. And I already have dreams of the fibery goodness I hope to find while I'm there. As always, I've linked this pattern down below. I knit mine out of Moondrake's Moonspun and Fua Fua and Spinsicle Yarns dyed in the wool. So you find all that information on the pattern page. And let's jump into some questions. So the first question we have today is about ribbing on the bottom of a sweater. In some cases, I don't want the sweater to pull in at the bottom, like in the third weekender I'm planning to knit. Yay, I'm so glad you've been enjoying the weekender, um, which I want to make longer, more of a tunic length. I have seen sweaters that use another stitch pattern like garter or something on the edges and hem. Is there a formula to know what stitch pattern would make a good edging? How do you know if it will lie flat and not curl like stockinette? Also, is there a way to make ribbing not pull in at the bottom if I decide I like the look of the rib but just don't want it to change the shape? So, uh, basically, stitch patterns that are going to curl, the reason that stockinette curls is because knit stitches and purl stitches aren't the same height and width. Knit stitches are taller, purl stitches are wider, and so that is what causes that rolling of the fabric. That's why garter stitch is great because it balances out those two stitches. So garter would be a great one to sub in, um, but you could really play around. One thing you could play around with if you wanted to add a fun little pop of color would be corrugated ribbing, which is basically when you're using color work in your ribbing and you're going to keep your knits one color and then make your purls a different color. I did this in the Sprite pullover and in last year's Rhinebeck sweater Alpenglow. And that can look so beautiful, but because it's color work, it doesn't, it means that the ribbing doesn't act how regular ribbing in, you really don't get that pull in. Um, it's not nearly as elastic. So that could be a fun way if you want to keep the ribbing and add a fun pop of color. You, I will also say, if you go pull out your other two weekenders, I would be curious how much you feel like that ribbing does pull in. Um, I find that in sweaters, even going down to needle sizes, once you block it out, that ribbing does generally open up a decent amount. Um, so one thing you could do, if you pull out your other weekenders and you're like, yeah, these still go in more than I want them to, you could try going down only one needle size instead of two, or you could try not going down any needle sizes. The best way to know what you're going to achieve isn't necessarily a formula, but is more swatching. So by even just doing a small little swatch so you can see how that fabric's gonna respond, is it gonna curl? Is it gonna be the width I want it? Um, would be playing around with a stitch, di stitch dictionary and doing some little swatches and seeing what you come up with and what you like. There's all kinds of fun plays on ribbing too where you can add in little cables or little lace panels, all kinds of fun things. Um, the ribbing on my, almost forgot the name of it, Morning Ritual sweater. It's a lavender. That one is tunic length. And I would be curious if I went down needle sizes for that ribbing. I can't remember off the top of my head, but that ribbing does have, um, there's some things buzzing outside my window there. It's distracting um but that has quite a bit of cables and I find that the ribbing on that sweater it doesn't do much of a pull in it's kind of just like a nice straight down um so yeah good luck I hope you find something that you really love next question I really want to make a try a traditional Icelandic sweater and turn it into a cardigan by steaking 
but in the same time, I'm not a fan of round neck cardigans. Is there any technique to do it neat and easy without having to do color work on the wrong side of the sweater? Hope you can help me. So yes, what you could do, you could still knit your Icelandic style sweater in the round. What you would do is you would put a steep column in, which isn't necessarily traditional to Icelandic sweaters, but if you put that steep column in, then what you can do is you can start shaping it for a V-neck by putting decreases on either side of that steak. So once you cut that open, those decreases are going to pull and give you a V-neck. Um, so that would be my suggestion. It would definitely be a little more of an adventure. And if you're feeling nervous about like, oh, how do I just jump into that? Um, you could always start doing a V-neck steaked cardigan that you can find in a pattern already written. So you can kind of get an idea of how long do you, how low do you want the V-neck to go and all those kinds of things. But it, I think it could be fairly straightforward if you wanted to try it out. Um, you would just need to figure out how deep you want your v-neck so you know where to start that shaping and how drastic like how much you want to carve out for your neck um, for that opening and just don't forget that you're going to be adding a button band but good luck next question i love to do the brioche stitch but every time i do it in the round i have trouble at the beginning of the row do you leave your yarn in front how do you know what stitch goes where etc I have only tried two color brioche. I would love to solve this problem because your Harlow hat is calling my name. So this is tricky for a lot of people. And honestly, I think it comes down to the fact that we really want to overthink it. I, a lot of people just, they don't feel like the directions are right. <laughs> There's gotta be something else special we need to do at the beginning of that round. Um, but generally speaking, if you follow the instructions as written, especially in Harlow, because I wrote that and I know, <laughs> then if you just trust, if you'll notice that I tell you exactly where to drop the yarn and everything. So if you follow that, you will be okay. But here's my tip that I think helps people push through maybe that overthinking or just feeling like it's not right, is consider the fact that when we are doing brioche in the round, it's in multiples of two. And where it can get tricky is depending on how the pattern's written, you can have two slip one yarn overs back to back. And that feels really awkward to have those yarn overs back to back like that. But they're not truly next to each other because you're working on a spiral, not in a circle. So as you spiral up, you're on the round above. So as long as you're dropping that yarn exactly where that pattern says, in general, and it can change, that's why I'm saying it's dependent on the pattern because it just depends, did they start the pattern um, with a burp stitch or and end it with a bark, which is going to adjust how, where that slip one yarn over is gonna fall. But generally speaking, we leave the yarn to the front. Also, one thing that I think is really helpful, I've actually got uh, my little, Harlow here that I'm working on. One thing I like to think about is using that, um, what you might call it. Oh, it had it for a second there. There it is. Uh, stitch marker as a barrier. And I think that really helps when you think of that as a physical barrier between one round and the next to get you up that spiral to the next step. Um, but I also do have, now I'm just gonna start knitting. I do have tutorials on brioche in the round um, here on YouTube. So I will link that below so you can peek at that too. And I hope that helps you. They're also linked in the Harlow patterns, by the way. All right, I started spinning about a year ago and I'm totally hooked. You've talked a couple times about how when you are making a two-ply yarn and one bobbin runs out before the other, you make a center pull ball with the remaining ply and ply it together from each end. My question is just, how do you do this? <laughs> On your ball winder? And then how do you stabilize the ball enough to ply the ends together? I tried this one and just had a tang once and just had a tangled mess but love the idea of using up every bit of my fiber. So I'm gonna grab something really quickly. Okay, 
So let us see a couple of things, y'all. So this is my Nostapin, which is how I like to wind up that last little bit of yarn of singles off of the bobbin. Now you could just use your thumb. That's what I used to do before I had one of these, but I do find this is handier on my thumb trying to do it off of the bobbin because I leave my other ply like still attached to where I'm plying those singles together. So I just find it's less awkward if I can use this and you could use, you know, anything that's kind of like this um, to make, I'm trying to find like even a toilet paper roll to wind it around. Um, but I do like having this. I think that this helps. I um, mean, it's just so much easier to slide it off of that tapered end than it is to slide it off of my thumb because without fail, I end up winding it too tight and then I'm like battling to get it off my thumb. Um, but so I wind a center pull ball using this. So I hold um, the tail on the grip here to keep that from winding into the ball. And then I wind it. And then when I pull it off, I have something like this that I'm left with. Nope. <laughs> Come on. Oh, there she is. So this is a center pole ball that has been hand wound. I actually wound this off of one of my drop spindles, um, which is waiting to be applied. But so then what I would do is I have one strand hanging off the outside, one coming from the middle, and then I would just ply those together. Now what I do to hold this as I'm plying on my wheel is I keep my fingers between these two strands. And I find that what happens is they kind of want to twist up around each other. So I use a rotation of my wrist to help with that. But sometimes I just let that go into the twist that is happening as I'm applying that two ply together and it tends to look fine. Um, but that's the only thing is sometimes you have to release it and then I put my hands back between them because if those are just wrapping around each other, you are going to have a mess. So I try to keep them separate with my hand kind of doing whatever motion I need to, to try and keep them as tidy as possible. Um, but that's all I do. And one note, just to keep in the back of your mind, depending on what you are plying together and how nitpicky you like to get, one thing to keep in mind is if you were doing a painted braid, <clears throat> something like, like this, if let's say I had spun this fractal and I got down to that last little bit and so then I just did a two ply, your color distribution is going to be a bit different than the rest of your skein. So that's just something to think about. Um, I've also done it, so for instance, with these skeins, which weren't from a painted braid, these are just from bats I made. I, when I got down to the end of my bobbins, I ended up actually doing my center pole ball and then I did um, I forgot the word. Chain flying. Whoo! It's kind of like a crochet chain. Um, and to finish it off because it won't really matter on here for the little bit I did it for. It's not going to affect how the color was coming together in my final skein. Wow, those are so soft and lovely. Oh my goodness. Ah. Uh, but for something like this, it would probably be noticeable when I go to knit it, I might have this patch that's just kind of weird and different than everything else. So I just want to point that out because it was something that I didn't necessarily think about back in the early days of my spinning. And I always wanted to use up every little bit. So I would just do it. And now it's like, oh, that might actually make my color distribution a little funky, especially if I'm doing a bigger project, like a sweater or something like that. So food for thought, fiber for thought. I was curious about how to tell the drafting method woolen or worsted spun when selecting yarn. I haven't noticed this information available on many yarn labels. Is there an easy way to figure out this when selecting yarn? Sometimes this information is on the Ravelry yarn page for a yarn and sometimes it isn't. So yes, one thing I will say is I tend to notice it is very rare that I see 
it mentioned when a yarn was spun worsted. I almost feel like that's the default as far as ready to knit yarn goes. But I do generally see on labels if it was spun woolen. That information seems to be included if that's the case. So there is a place you can start. You might be able to assume that it's worsted unless it says woolen, but that's not a for sure. It's just something I've noticed. Um, another thing you can do is look at it visually. So this is a worsted spun yarn that I spun up and it's smooth. Here's what I found. Oh, <laughs> hush. Um, it's smooth in appearance. All of the when I spun this, I was pushing down on the fibers as it spun, so it's not going to be roughed up. It's the way the fibers prepped as well. It just gives us a smoother yarn, whereas a woolen spun yarn is going to be a little more rough and ready, and it's also going to feel depends on the skein and everything. But a lot of times, too, worsted spun yarns are going to feel a little heavier because they don't have air in them that air has been squeezed out whereas a woolen spun yarn is going to be like light and lofty um because they're full of air you might even notice that in the yardage listed where a worsted spun yarn for the weight might not have as much yardage as a woolen spun yarn for the weight so let's say like these were both 100 grams and this one had 250 yards but this one had 300 yards um, because this one at that weight, a lot of that weight was air. Does that make sense? Now I feel like I'm sounding confusing. <laughs> Hope you know what I'm saying. Um, so those are the things that I would kind of think of visually to look at is the roughness, the smoothness, how heavy or dense they feel. And then also you can always look it up or reach out to that company and say, hey, I'm just wondering about your yarns. And you might, if you're at your local yarn shop, there's a good chance that the employees might be able to tell you too more about that yarn. Um, so yeah, there you go. That is how I would think about it. So that's all of our questions. Our Attune Shawl Knit Along just wrapped up. Oh my gosh, it has been so fun to have my Instagram feed just full of beautiful hand-spun Attune Shawls. Um, so that wrapped up. I have been hinting to all of you that a new Spin It to Knit It Knit Along is coming and it is. I am having a thought about it that involves some new patterns and I'm trying to decide basically, maybe I'll get your, your thoughts and opinions. Basically, I, I know the pattern that I'm planning to center the knit along around, but I have some ideas for a couple follow-up patterns that would be fun that fall into the same category as the one I wanna use. So I was like, ooh, and they're all three different. So it would give like a large, medium, small project. It would, yeah, basically it would, it would give options in the knit along. So it wouldn't just be the sweater. It would also be two other things you could knit. But the two new patterns haven't been released yet and probably won't be until the new year. So I'm trying to decide, do I wait? and we could have a knit along. Doesn't that sound kind of fun to have a spin it to knit it with like a whole group of patterns and you could pick which one you want to do? Because I also know we all have different amounts of time, especially when we are multi-craftual and we want to spin, we want to knit, we want to do all the things, but how many hours are in a day? So that's what I've been thinking about. In the meantime, thankfully, there are loads of knit alongs going on. We are getting close to the end of our, this year's Ryan Beck knit along. <laughs> But coming up next is our Insta Friends Knit Along. It's just around the corner and I cannot wait to show you that pattern. And my sock knit along challenge is just around the corner too. So we do have a couple knit alongs to get us through. So maybe if we can hold off to the new year, then I can announce the next spin it to knit it. So let me know what you think. Are you, you just so excited and you want me to get that information out now? Or should we wait and make it like a mega spin along knit along let me know what you think 
and thank you so much for joining me. I hope you have a fantastic weekend. Thanks as always for sending in your questions because I could not do this without y'all doing that. And I hope to see you back here next week. Have a good one. Bye.